me uh, do another segment here on product market fit. And this is this whole movement called Lean Launchpad. And sometimes you'll hear, hear the term Lean Startup. But uh, uh, the reason we're not necessarily using that term here is because the, the methodology would be the same whether you're thinking about a license or, or a spin out of a company. Okay. And the basic idea here is you're, there's tons of uncertainty in marketplaces. How can you bound that uncertainty? Okay. Um, and do it without spending a ton of money like those examples that I gave to you at the very beginning of this segment. And so the approach is around starting with uh, primary research, which feels really unscientific. It's very qualitative. It's very direct. It's about developing an, an intuition of what, uh, what is actually going on among, uh, among customers in that broad sense of the term that I was just talking about. People who are in the biomedical uh, engineering program here at the U um, actually do shadowing of healthcare professionals as they develop their ideas. And actually, so do people in our medical devices uh, uh, program, the, the fellows. That's an example of primary market research. And there are protocols you would, you would do uh, to be able to make sure you're, you're actually capturing meaningful information. Another thing that in the Lean Launchpad world, and I'll explain to you who all these people are on the, on the, uh, on the one side in a, in a minute. Um, another thing that there, there's a lot of encouragement of is so-called customer interviews. Actually talking not just to end users, but maybe having an early discussion with a regulator, maybe having a discussion with a hospital administrator. Um, then, assuming you've got some primary re market research, then you sort of play with, well, it, what if I offered this? What if I offered that? Okay. Now, it could also be that you say, I, I want to do licensing, and I don't ever want to touch that end customer. But to some degree, you have to have an exercise in imagination enough to make your licensee want to touch that end customer. So at least give them some sense of what the direction might be. And, um, and so experimentation in the software world is easy, right? Market experimentation. Uh, because, you know, you're not going to kill anybody, right, when you, when you do that kind of thing. You're, what, you, you cross your fingers. Um, it's a different deal when you're talking about uh, ph pharma or, or, um, or device or, or some devices, depends on what they are. Okay. But this whole idea of, of playing with things as you're going along and iteratively gathering information. And that's where the staging comes in. In MinReach, I don't know how much detail you guys have looked at, there is a potential of $150,000, right? You guys all know that? How much do you get up front? Twenty five hundred. Well, is, is it twenty five hundred? Up to, I think. Okay. For some of us, that wouldn't really help us a lot. Right, twenty five hundred, <laughs> and that might be you know make a little prototype, go to a conference, things like that. But the trot, in the venture cap, that what they're really doing is they're picking up for my world. Okay, in the venture capital world, the term for uh, chunks of money is tranche. T R A N C H E. Okay? So basically, they're looking at sequences of tranches of money as you reach different milestones. Okay? And, uh, and the milestones depend on whatever the project is. That process becomes a form of de risking, meaning that you started with a whole bunch of uncertainty and you're building knowledge and understanding as you're going along while spending limited amounts of money and time. 
Um, going back to Chuck's example of, well, you know, I, I did this really precise and expensive approach to understanding uh, um, the functionality of my product when I could have done something um, that the, the FDA actually asked for something simpler. That's an example where a little doing something a little bit earlier can help de-risk and make things less expensive. Okay. Um, Lean Launchpad has lots of components to it. It can be very overwhelming. Uh, our initial focus is on product market fit because if you don't have that, forget about all the financials and all the, and all the other stuff. Okay. Um, and focusing in on market segments, customer segments. Then we worry about the overall business model. So now let me tell you about these guys here and where the I, NSF and the NIH come in. Um, this guy here, Steve Blank, is a very successful um, Silicon Valley entrepreneur. And his success, he's, he's an engineer, software engineer, and his success has been uh, through a series of, of, soft, of software companies. Okay. And then he retired, and his way of giving back to the world is his retirement job is actually really, really active. He's become an evangelist for this lean launch pad approach, a lot of which he developed over the years in his own experience. So this is one of his books, Four Steps to Epiphany. He's got a couple of others. He has a fantastic website in terms of uh, uh, anything he's ever developed um, is on there in terms of uh, stuff he's done with uh, life sciences, stuff he's done with different uh, institutions. All his uh, videos and his, and his uh, PowerPoints, et cetera, are on that website. Um, he and the NSF kind of uh, joined forces. And the NSF actually went to him and said, you know, we're really impressed with your approach, and we think that it can help address our big frustration with SBIR. That was the starting point. What does SBIR stand for? Small business something. Yeah, blah, 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 right? Small business innovation research, okay? And STTR is small business technology transfer research, okay? SBIR are separate companies. STTR are partnerships between universities and separate companies, okay? The NSF was feeling they were wasting a whole bunch of money, okay? And so, and what they, and what they focused in on was that there was not really a good sense of what that overall business model looked like, especially around product market fit which Steve Blank had, was basically promulgating a methodology to address. Okay. Um, Steve Blank, along the way, joined forces, um, not in the literal sense, but in the uh, kind of spiritual sense, with these two guys. Alexander Ost Osterwalder, who uh, was a guy who wrote a, a PhD thesis Suggesting that uh, you can that a successful startup, and he was focusing in on startups, although he's moved more into also product development in general. A successful startup needs to think about a whole variety of different components of a business model, and the phrase became business model canvas. And then more recently, he's. He's uh, published another book on value proposition design, which we will be pulling a whole lot from in our, in our workshops. And then this guy, Eric Reese. So these guys are, Cal uh, this guy's Europe. This guy's California. This guy is kind of, that bounces between Harvard and MIT and, uh, and Northern California. Okay. And Eric Reese started, actually coined this phrase, the lean startup. And, um, and his thing was to apply lean, uh, lean principles that were actually started uh, by Toyota in manufacturing and start applying it to the, the business development world. Now, in hospitals right now, lean is 
depending on who you talk to, either the greatest thing or the worst thing that's ever happened, right? Um, so I, I, have, I have a physician friend who just hates this because it's being applied in a very um, um, unnuanced way in their organization. It's really about, you know, just like let's, let's cut costs in any way possible as opposed to maximizing effectiveness, which is what lean really is about, okay? And it's very much about in increment, understanding what you're doing, not building, uh, not spending a ton of money before you need to, and really having good evidence from stage one to stage two to stage three. Okay. There's another guy uh, in the background at, at MIT, a guy named Bill Olette, who has written a book called Disciplined Entrepreneurship, which we'll also be pulling from in the, uh, in the value proposition series. So uh, a few years ago, the NSF said, OK, we're, we want researchers around the country to start doing this stuff and start understanding commercialization, understanding entrepreneurialism. And so that became the Innovation, National Innovation Corps. And uh, the University of Minnesota is a site for the National Innovation Corps, which means my job is to develop educational programs for, uh, for people like you. We did a whole bunch of seminars uh, the, over the last year. They were kind of more one-off. Now what we're looking at is something that's more around skill building, like we're seeing here, with a starting point with technology commercialization. Um, meanwhile, the NIH looked at what was going on at the NSF and said, uh, essentially, we want that too. And this is brand new. We are the, one of the first three institutions who are, who are getting these REACH grants. The other two are uh, New York uh, SUNY, State University of New York at Stony Brook, plus a couple of other institutions there, and University of Louisville. Each of them are also National Innovation Corps sites. And the expectation of the NIH is that the methodologies that these guys as a group have started to put together um, and, is, and is shared in the i framework also should carry over to NIH or NIH reach sites, okay, or hubs, I guess. Okay. So that's, that's kind of the background here. Okay. Business model is a comprehensive approach. There is you know, it's, it's very overwhelming. Okay. So you have your value propositions, your customer segments, how you relate to your customers. Channel means how you distribute to your customers, how, what, what methods you sell them to them through. So it might be through sales forces. It might be through uh, other organizations. Okay. Um, Key activities as in terms of like, okay, what's the business going to do? What resources are required? What external partners might you need? And then finally, what's my revenue? What's my cost? Uh, given the examples that we just had um, in our, uh, as, as we've been talking here, you guys aren't ready for this, right? This is... You, this requires a lot of development to get there, okay? But what you are ready for is to think about the value proposition and your customers, because that then drives everything else. And the phrase for that is product market fit. Whoops. Set aside the rest of the business model canvas, and if you, if you do any Googling around this stuff, you'll, you'll see a lot. Um, we'll, you'll get there. Okay. First step is product market fit. Now, I haven't used this term yet, value proposition. Think back to the little girl with that box of Cheez-Its or whatever it was. What's the value proposition to her? What does she want? It's delicious. it's delicious. 
That's, that's it, right? It's delicious. I want this, I want this, this snack, okay? And maybe she's hungry. Maybe we're satisfying hunger, but it's more about taste. What's the value proposition to the mom? Potentially, and sometimes when I've done the role plays, the parents totally cave um, because, you know, it, you know, kids can really make a scene, right? Um, or it might be, you know, and a different kind of mom who says health is more important than, than keeping the peace. So understanding the value proposition from the point of view of these different um, uh, characters, well, I'm sorry, I keep moving things along here, becomes important. One of the things that becomes a, a real challenge for, for, for people in general who are very attached to their, their product is they tend to talk about it in terms of what it does and kind of what its, its, its features as opposed to what it does for somebody, okay? And, and so the whole point here is you're satisfying some kind of need or solving some kind of problem. And you may end up iterating a few times as you figure this out. And when we think about customer segments, it's not just who are they, but again, their perspective. Putting your, it's an act of imagination. What do they care about? Okay. Um, I'm not doing this on purpose. Um, and there's, you know, there's specifics you get into this. One thing that I see a lot, um, even, even with people that you think of as being much more sophisticated in the business world, is they assume if their product is great, then the customer is just going to buy it. No, there, there are th some steps along the way. Okay. All right. So here's the methodology. It's called Value Proposition Canvas. And, uh, and so in, the, in that business model canvas, these are customer segments. This is value proposition, but now we break it down into pieces. This is a concept, so-called customer jobs, uh, that was actually uh, first promulgated by a guy named Clayton Christensen at Harvard Business School, and then was adopted by Oster Wellman. And the whole idea is that uh, various customer segments have things that they need to do. And so, and so they, it's referred to as jobs, okay? Um, and the, the point is, They've got tasks to perform, problems to solve, needs to satisfy. And in the context of mapping out your, your proposal, it's helpful to really think about this. What, is, what do these guys care about? Okay. Um, what, do they, what do they actually do? So you may have something that uh, is really uh, great in the narrow sense but it doesn't matter a whole lot in the scheme of the, the so-called jobs they do. The importance is relatively low. Or it might be the opposite, that you can target something that really matters to their effectiveness. And then we have customer pains, frustrations, um, bad outcomes, a lot of that in healthcare world, right? Um, and then, obviously, customer gains. What, what would they like more of? What would they like to be better? So here's an example. I don't know how well. This is actually out of a, of a workshop um, in Northern California that Steve Blank did, the guy with the white hair. Um, at um, University of California at San Francisco. And uh, this, so let me explain to you what's going on here. 
the phrase that uh, Steve Blank uses for all those customer roles is multi-sided market. Okay, that's one one thing you see in the business world, as opposed to many scientific disciplines, is really sloppy use of terminology. Okay, so you'll see similar terms used for uh, different things, and then different things having similar terms. Okay, um, did I just say they? I just, I'm sorry. Similar things having different terms. Okay, so in this case, multi-sided market, different different customer segments or roles. Okay, patients, providers. In this case, device manufacturers, because this is a software product that could be bought by incorporated into device manufacturers' uh, project products. Third-party app developers and researchers. Okay, those were the ones that they identified, and then they mapped out jobs pains, gains by each of these roles. Okay. And, and, there's, and basically this is around some of the, the frustrations of, of tracking um, uh, the, the condition of, of a diabetic over time. Okay. So that's, so they start, they have that and then they say, well, what about the product side? So now it's like, okay, well, what do you do? It is amazing how hard it is for people to say that in a short sentence. It's really hard. And again, not unique to non-business people. This is, uh, this is just a hard thing to do. And the closer you are to it, the harder it is to distill. So now you're saying, okay, how do I relieve those pains? How do I create gains? So this is, uh, this is harder to read because I couldn't get it to be super clear. But here in, uh, in this workshop, they, um, they still kept these five. And they said, okay, we're going to have software that makes it easier to get and interpret diabetes data, and there are actually two players that care about that. Um, we're going to have this amazing database that can be extracted, that, that we can do custom, they call it custom extractions, but you can imagine a sort of data mining kind of approach, okay? Um, that there would be, the, that there would be some kind of open data platform and hosting service that, uh, that multiple, uh, um, players could make use of. Okay, so we got some pain relievers and we have some gain creators as well. The thing to note here is there is a lot. Even though they, we've only got like a, a sentence or two around each about, around each player, this is complicated. This is very complicated. There's a lot of people that you need to satisfy here. So then these guys worked on this over a, a series of, 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 um, of not so much workshops, but um, you can call them almost encounters. They did a lot of market research, primary market research. And they ended up with something much simpler. Before it was a multi-sided market, now it's a two-sided market. They've decided, I'm just going to focus on the device manufacturers and the end, the end users, the patients. And the, you know, the other guys, you know, maybe the device manufacturers will worry about. Okay. Um, and, and this distilling process, where a lot of times you start out with many, many possibilities, and then you narrow it becomes one of the outcomes of these kinds of processes. Now, you may or may not get to that point six weeks from now, okay? You might, you might be on the starting point of that, okay? But that's where, you know, you'll, you'll have additional tranches of research and you'll, we'll, there'll be other opportunities to keep refining your approach. What do you think?
Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in my limited experience of starting to learn some of these things, this the hardest part of this is knocking us out of our our uh, assumptions and uh, those things you mentioned about we believe in what we're doing and all these things. Yeah. Being honest about those elements is hard for us and takes some kicks in the pants. It is really hard, and we'll use the phrase in a, in a little bit, to get out of the building and actually talk to people who might make you feel bad. Okay, um, And it's very easy to dismiss what they might have to say because they're maybe not that knowledgeable. And that's one of the, and, and it's just, you know, it's just a psychological fact. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was going to, but I'll, I'll say this. So when I would work on this uh, in the, the program that predicated this, the CPD, I got frustrated with the term translational research. Mm -hmm. At least in the university, we talk to people that mostly know what we're doing. Yeah. But the real translation research in the commercial world is you talk to people that don't know what you're doing. You as a researcher talk to someone who's a marketing manager. You talk to someone who's a patenter. You talk to someone who's going to have to manufacture this. And, I mean, the simple examples are you may make a drug that works great, but it's insoluble. Someone does not have a formula. So you need to talk to a formulation, a chemical engineer. Or you may have something that's dangerous. Uh, you work with it in a microgram quantity. Someone has to make 500 kilograms and blend it into pills. I mean, translational research in the real world is dealing with people who don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Who, you know, who's going to price it out? Who's going to do the market research? People that don't have sk relevant skills. I mean, to, to talk with a, someone who's got a, a business degree who's 25 years selling things doesn't have much in common with most people in this room. And you better convince that person that you've got something valuable. There's a newspaper writer in town called Sharon Schmickel. If anybody knows her, she writes for the Star Tribune. She's a journalist, but she writes about science. And she says, if I can understand it, I can write it. I'm not a scientist, so I have to meet with, she interviews a lot of university faculty. So I have to talk to them a lot so I can understand it, so that I can translate it to the public. So I think that's what Carl is talking about, talking yeah. to people outside of your comfort zone. It, the university's definition of translational research is you talk to people down the hall or another <laughs> building, not in another discipline. So let me, uh, th thank you so much. And let me give you an example of uh, some of the challenges that you wake up to uh, when, you, when you, quote, get out of the building. Um, one of the courses that we offer is called Startup which uh, is uh, to actually take a 14-week course from, from uh, concept to a, a fuller understanding of what, of what your, your business idea is. And 14 weeks, you have a lot of time to do this kind of research. And um, last fall, we had a, a nursing uh, PhD student who um, was involved with a, an effort um, for a, a basically trauma treatment. Um, and, I, and I don't remember the specifics of how it worked, but it worked really, really well in controlled circumstances. Okay? And what she was encouraged to do by the faculty was find out what, hap what it's like in real life. Now, Kirk, were you, were you in any way exposed to that one? Okay. So she went on riot, she went and talked to ambulance drivers. And she went and got an understanding of how, where, where is the supplies? Where do they keep the supplies? How long are they kept? What are, under what conditions are they kept? And discovered that one of the issues was no refrigeration, completely uncontrolled temperatures. Okay. And, uh, and not and, and not necessarily frequent restocking of supplies. So this is all, you know, this is all stuff that in real life you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily you would you would say, yeah, that's that's all really, really key. In the lab, 
works great. And not just in the lab. In, in controlled settings, it works great. Move out there. Then you have to start thinking about maybe alternative formulations or alternative packaging that they hadn't thought about yet. So this is a summary. I'm not going to read all of this uh, through for you. But the, the point is that um, uh, value propositions, they're kind of good ones and not so good ones. And part of your challenge is to, to figure out how to make it better and better. Not necessarily something you do all at once. Again, it's an iterative process.